Hello and welcome to another episode of the IFEC Focus Series. Today I'm very lucky to be joined by Josh Ferno, known within esports affectionately as Fern or Coach Fern. Now, the core purpose of today's episode really is to explore Fern's experience, his time coaching, and you know his uh, his role in this new job that he's he's recently taken up with um, an esports agency. So, to begin with, then Fern, you know, welcome. Thank you very much for coming on board. I can't wait to get chatting and, and see where this goes. No, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. No. No problem, no problem at all. So to start with then, I mean, first off, uh, for those who don't know, who are you and what is your role in esports currently? So my current role in esports is uh, an esports agent with ICM Stella, which is uh, a huge esports agent. Uh, well, they're, they're a huge everything agency now, not not just esports. I mean, they traditionally started in, in football kind of 30 years ago mm. and have branched out through different sports um, and then into esports in the last couple of years prior to the uh, prior to kind of um the last prior to me joining anyway they were acquired or, or kind of partnered with icm which is kind of they run talent in hollywood and over in america so uh musicians actors actresses people like samuel l jackson beyonce are all part of um wow. the icm stellar agency and then from a from a sports side people like jack Grealish, gareth bale um for as kind of big football names are uh, again under the icm stellar um, side of things my responsibility there is is that i'm kind of lead on league of legends um within within the esports department of the agency so um i think outside of that uh, i have been known as as you said as a coach for years in in league of legends before moving into into this agency role um i think i'd probably had about seven professional years as a league of legends coach uh, and then prior to that was um was kind of building my own, I guess, philosophy of coaching or teaching, um, doing a, a teaching degree at university and prior to that, a sports science diploma at, at college. So I've kind of built my own ideas around uh, around coaching, player development, personal development, um, systems of, of kind of building a team and uh, how, how that all kind of merges together to, to make the people around you better, I suppose, is the, wow. is the key. Yeah, yeah, well, brilliant. That's, that's so interesting. I mean, hopefully we'll see Beyonce in League of Legends at some point then. Uh, it sounds like you could pull some strings, maybe maybe get that to happen. Um, yeah, <laughs> but, very uh, true. No, so, so cool to hear about your your background as well. I'm assuming a lot of this sort of ethos comes from traditional coaching and traditional sport coaching. Is that fair? Yeah, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a huge amount of transferable skills. I think as a coach, um, the fundamentals of coaching are applicable to almost any game, you know, or any sport, uh, like uh, the fundamentals of, of um, kind of player growth or, or student growth or mm. whether it's teaching, whether it's coaching are very transferable between, between disciplines effectively. Um, but yeah, originally uh, I guess my passion for coaching came with a kind of mixture of teaching and a, and a love for football as well so between both of these i, I developed i mean yeah what, what even whether it was in like maths or english working with children or or sport playing football or rugby or anything like this is uh, growing up i always took pleasure in um seeing those around me become become better at what they were doing and, and reaching a reaching a potential that perhaps they didn't know they had Brilliant. Wow. So, so I guess your sort of core philosophy and ethos is really around helping people grow and scaffold in them and, and pushing them towards being the best that they can be really to, to borrow a cliche. Brilliant. Good stuff. Um, yeah, so, no, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. I think there was some lag there. That's, uh, that's no problem. So the next question then, uh, quite a big one really, I guess for you is how did you get into your current role first? So your role with this esports agency, what, what kind of led to that uh, joining ICM Stella? So, yeah, I mean, it was completely out of the blue, in, in honesty. I um, was at a point in my career where I, I guess I'd had a, a pretty bad experience with uh, my most recent team that I was coaching. Um, and there's a lot of kind of shady stuff that went on in the background and not being paid. I, I lost a lot of trust with some of the kind of what shouldn't be but are run kind of amateur organizations um and was a little bit unsure of where i wanted to go next whether i kind of took a leap into something similar and just hoped it was better or um 
re- really what what was going to occur. I also think my perhaps my reputation was was slightly damaged by the the lack of success that happened there due to all of the kind of uh, behind the scenes things going on. So I was really ser- taking a bit of time off and then going to search for uh, new coaching jobs for 2021. Um, and then kind of late 2020, I had an approach from from someone who uh, kind of was running the esports department at ICM Stella, um, wanting to just arrange an interview to see whether I would be uh, fit or, or kind of um, a good fit for what they were looking for, for, for the role. So, yeah, I, I mean, at that time I had nothing concrete. I had nothing set. I wasn't exactly sure where um, my career was heading. I mean, I, I'm not finished coaching. I, I wasn't finished coaching then and anyway, uh, but uh, what I did know is that I needed something more stable, something more long term, mm. something more solid in my life that I could know where I was going to be in six months, where I was going to be in twelve months, and and have a real base. And I think the flexibility that they gave me, obviously, most people at that time were were kind of working online or or working at home. Um, a big part of of esports coaching, anyway, is that you often move around to different places, living with your team um and it's very short-term aspects at the moment i mean hopefully that changes as the longer term goes but uh with icm stella they gave me a lot of flexibility to stay at home for as long as i wanted i got i got a partner here and and she works locally so if i was going to have to move it would have to put a strain on that as well as um knowing where i was going to move and 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 all sorts about it really i mean i have to do a lot of traveling within this job but ultimately my base can be at home Mm. um but yeah the interviews went well they saw in me what they wanted, which was uh, that they didn't care that I didn't have any agency experience. What they cared about is that I was passionate about the the discipline that I was looking at, which was League of Legends or the esport that I was looking at, and that I had a, a vast enough knowledge of the ecosystem and of the the player base that I would be able to attract the talent that they would want to get on board to actually um, really turn the esports department into into something where lots of players would want to get involved with and they could actually see real value in having an agent, which in esports, having an agent is um, kind of in its infancy, I guess, for, for a mm-hmm. lot of players. So um, really adding value to, to that space. Brilliant. Wow. I mean, uh, it's so fascinating to see the, the growth of esports almost parallel to the traditional side going from an amateur to pro era where we're, we're starting to see this transition away from amateur grassroots which is still as you said earlier very much there in esports without a doubt but there's starting to be this trickle through i think of professionalism and professionalization of the industry and and having an agent and um, an agency to the work for i think really speaks to that Great, good stuff. Um, <clears throat> so when, this might be quite a tough question in regards to the agency side of things, you kind of spoke about it a little bit there, I think, but when was the moment that you kind of realised that this was really what you wanted to do? I mean, I, I heard you say a lot about um, you know having perhaps that security, that regularity that you don't often get within esports. Yeah. Um, I think it was a, a combination of, of not really having coaching offers that, that, I felt would really enable me to propel myself uh, back to kind of the LEC level, the tier one level that I wanted to be at, um, that I felt I, I was capable of working at. And I think at Munster, I actually um, did a lot of work to to try and rectify some of the mistakes that I, w- I made first time around when I had my shot at the LEC. So uh, for me, again, it was like, how, how close can I get to, to being at that tier one level uh, as a coach in League of Legends? And when those opportunities didn't really present itself, as well as the ICM Stellar opportunity actually presenting itself, um, alongside all the stuff I just spoke about with the the kind of security, the long-term nature of the role, the fact that there there seemed very obviously uh, a lot of growth within within that role uh, and that I could mature into something like uh, I'm... I'm always someone who's very driven to be like the best at what I do for, I mean, it's just even like, I remember being like a 14, 15 year old in, and I was working like a, a supermarket on the weekend. And there was, um, there was some kind of, uh, some kind of like you got based on how many, how quick you could get things through the till basically. Uh, and like even little stupid things like that have always yeah, been yeah. like very competitive to, to even if the, the actual nature of the competition is, is kind of silly. So um, the, it was appealing to me that I, that I think with esports agencies being in their kind of uh, infancy, that 
I could do a good enough job after, with my experience in in the kind of the, that space that it, it became really appealing. So uh, I think yeah, a combination of the the coaching roles not perhaps being there that I really wanted, as well as this opportunity presenting itself, and then the benefits that come alongside that really drove me to to thinking actually I, I, I think I could be one of the top League of Legends agents in Europe possibly. So yeah. yeah. Brilliant, without a doubt. Good. So it sounds like a lot of things kind of aligned at the same time, which is really, really useful for you. Good. That's, that's good to hear. I guess um, on the flip side, then, for those coaches that are listening, you know, when you got into coaching all, all those years ago, when did you realize perhaps that it was esports coaching and specifically League of Legends coaching that you wanted to get into? Um, if, if we take it all the way back there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it was. I enjoyed League of Legends. I enjoyed playing League of Legends casually. I mean, I was I was never any good. Like I was like a gold <laughs> or platinum player or something. Um, but I had lots of friends who were perhaps slightly better than me mechanically and slightly better at the game. We would play a little bit longer or whatever. Uh, and they would enter kind of like weekly open sign-up tournaments where you could like sign up and win some RP or uh, win RP gift cards or things like that. And my role within that very much initially because of my coaching and teaching background just seemed naturally to be like, I'm going to watch the games and, and see if we can get better next week than we were this week. And um, I, I guess in its, in its most kind of early development forms, that's what it was. It was just like me helping some wow. friends and, and discussing with them um, how they could, how they could perhaps be better or how they could talk to each other differently, but actually um, the things that they were saying to each other, be more receptive to the other one to be better. And it, there was no money involved. There was no, there was no, organizations involved it was just like five players as friends playing together trying to win some rp but trying to be more successful at doing that next week than they were this week and the, i guess that ignited the fire to be like actually maybe like from that and then watching the the early stages of pro play the early kind of eu lcs years and mm -hmm. and north american lcs years and seeing these teams start to kind of have coaches i was like mm, maybe actually that's something that would be so cool to do rather than Brilliant. going down the traditional route of either teaching or or kind of football or, or, or a, a different sport. I think back then, I, I, after just kind of finishing my degree in teaching, it was apparent to me that I, I loved working with children and working with students uh, and trying to help them develop, but I didn't love the politics behind teaching and, and the, the way that you have to teach to the test the way that it's yeah. all about impressing Ofsted, the way that it's all about <clears throat> um, trying to get numbers of children in schools rather than unlocking the absolute maximum potential of the children that you've got. So there was lots of bits about teaching in the background that I really didn't want to do after my degree, but there's a lot of skills that I'd harvest, like harnessed and gained from my degree and, and also my passion. So League of Legends felt a way that I could channel that into something where there wasn't so, so many governed rules I could do it on my own terms and I could develop myself and my own personal philosophy and impart that into, into something that I also just enjoyed doing. Brilliant. Obviously it became as, as time went on, it became a lot of time invested for nothing, for, for little gain other than like self personal gain. So it had to either become something I was going to be paid for or, uh, I had to go down a different alley because uh, as we all get older, we, we have bills to pay. We have, um, yes. we have things to put on the table. So th th there's, there's part of that. And that's where the life pressures came. And I, I was very fortunate that my parents were very supportive and it was okay for them that I'd be on very little money uh, and they would support me by like allowing me to live at home or whatever mm -hmm. for, for extended periods while I tried to kind of build up a reputation that, that hopefully allowed me to secure actual professional league of legends jobs yeah and it's a it's a tough thing that it's one of the hardest things i think for new coaches out there is kind of knowing where where do i start in, in building that reputation and i think it's, it's really important to take a look at, at your journey really and you literally did just start with um some friends you know you started testing the waters seeing how how your coaching style developed and then backed up thankfully by tons of brilliant um you know, educational work in, in the teaching side of things, but you really wanted to take your passion through uh, to, to League of Legends, which, which at its core was, was what you wanted to do without those, uh, like you say, politics and those extra rules, which would stop you from really pushing the individuals to where you thought they could go, which is so, so yeah. cool to hear. <clears throat> 
good, good stuff. So we've, we've had a bit, I think, then about sort of when you realise the, the right times for these roles for you. Um, but can you just talk us through at your current job, you know, what a typical day might look like? For those that are listening who might be interested, maybe I could be an esports agent one day after sure. perhaps being a coach, after being a player. What does that look like for you? So I, I guess my my year almost is split into two sections, which is kind of on-season and off-season. Um, historically, as a coach, the on-season would always be the really busy part where every single day I was practicing with the team and, and such, whereas in this role, it's kind of roles reversed a little bit. I mean, both are fairly busy, but the off-season obviously goes completely mad because any yeah. players that I have that are out of contract, I have thousand well, hundreds probably of teams looking at my pl- my current crop of players and um as a result i'm in constant talks but so i'll just i'll do i'll do a on-season day and an off-season day and on-season day where the teams are actually playing all the players are in contract looks much more like um checking in with my players just checking everything in their current team is okay making sure that they're happy with with what's going on making sure that both them and the team are kind of fulfilling contractual obligations so that um to, just to ensure everything's running smoothly taking care of anything of, for the players that that effectively would deflect their their kind of attention off of playing because ultimately I, I just want them to play as much as they can and, and perform as as best they can and learn more and more about the game become the better player um and obviously the development side of that player for the most part is now determined by their own coach but uh i, I try and remove the stuff that could be kind of any kind of distractions for their playing career um while i guess the most part of my job now is uh, i'm a a league of legends scout throughout the on season so i'm trying to find and scout out upcoming talent that i think has that has shown me potential to to really make it to the top or make it to tier one uh, and then as a result contact that player try and sign that player to the agency and then represent that player throughout the next steps of their career um that that's mostly uh, on season so watching lots of league of legends making sure my current clients are okay uh, and then trying to sign um trying to sign upcoming players to our agency or or players that i really think that we could propel with the services that we provide um mm-hmm. in the off season it, it's it's much more me ensuring that any team that wants a player of within a certain role that i've got players that can fit into that role and i would like to fit into that role um effectively me trying to make a pitch to sell my players to to those teams so i'll i mean in the last off season example i spoke to every single lec team every single north american lcs team every single team from uh the nlc the super league uh the LFL, anyone who's not familiar, that's uh, like the Nordic in UK, the the French, uh, the Spanish League, the French League, and the Prime League, which is the German League. Um, I spoke to every single team from these, as well as kind of various different teams from uh, from other leagues as well, and and various academies and such. But um, yeah, the, that time it goes completely mad because you never know when a player is going to be like, oh, this team's trying to wants to speak to you or whatever, and and everything crops up, and you have a million meetings a week, and um, th- there's a lot going on. Whereas in the on season it's kind of more at my own pace but um it's really trying to me organize my my time in the best way possible to be as efficient as possible and make sure that i see talent before other agencies see talent or um i see talent that uh, that i get it right when i when i'm picking up a player because we're we're committing quite a long time to to these players we're normally committing kind of two years to uh, of representing a player and if i don't if we can't push that player it's really not that beneficial for both so i really have to see that kind of spark that that um initial something about the player that really makes me think i i think I, we can help this player really go far so yeah it, it's me being able to notice that which is i, I guess a big part of why uh i see seller wanted me in the first place is because they think that i can see that whereas they could watch hundreds of games of league of legends and have no clue you know yeah, like yeah. Uh, someone does good in the game but it really doesn't matter but um my yeah. years of experience <clears throat> coaching is kind of uh, i guess give me an eye for uh who's good and who's not or who can make it and who can't definitely i mean that, that, that's fascinating hearing all the the kind of different facets and obviously i mean i didn't even think of it but yeah the off season is bound to be crazy and, and hectic whilst the on season i guess you take more of a 
uh, a supportive, friendly role, trying to keep those players in tip-top condition, help them, you know, keep uh, their, their other commitments um, in your hands so they can just focus on what they need to focus on. But then when it comes to the off-season, it sounds like you're running around uh, left, right and centre yeah. trying to get meetings, yeah. chat with people. <laughs> and obviously with the nature, like we said before, we're, we're talking about my situation, with the nature of short-term contracts in, in League of Legends, a lot of the time is that Every single off season, the player is is having to find a new contract almost. Yeah. So, um, I, I think most of the bigger ARLs now, especially ones that are offline, where the, where you actually travel to the house, they n- normally give a year contract, so a two split deal, a spring split, and a, a summer split. But there's very few kind of in, in football or something like this. Traditionally, we see a lot of four year, five year deals. This doesn't happen in esports right now. I mean, two to three years is really like the maximum that occurs um, for the most part in the ARLs. Uh, and this is both both from kind of the player standpoint and the team standpoint is, is that the teams don't want to commit to a player they're not 100% sure on. So they don't want to be locked to contract with a player contracted to them that is effectively on the payroll uh, without the team being certain that this player is going to help them succeed. And then also players are, are very reluctant to sign long-term deals because ultimately they want to make that step up to the LEC and they think that being locked into a contract long-term is going to prevent them from actually making that step up. And in, in some cases that, that is accurate. I, I think uh, down the line for me, I think it, it's more likely that we'll see more longer-term deals and if a team wants to to take a player, they'll have to take a player that's in contract and pay a buyout. Um, but then the buyouts need to accurately reflect reflect market value rather than just being kind of terms in contracts, which they have been sometimes. It's like yeah. the buyout is up to the the selling team and they just say like, well, pay three million and you can have him. And the other team says, we haven't got three million so the yeah. player can <laughs> never leave until the end of this contract. So um, yeah. Wow. Wow. It's, it's so complex. I mean, I, yeah, I, I definitely couldn't do it, but it sounds so interesting. It sounds like you're, you're kind of making headway, but there's a lot of skill, I think, involved, which is obviously, as you say, that's why why they picked you up, because you, you can see that spark and that what makes these players unique, hopefully. And then it's uh, it's obviously a big risk taking players on, but it sounds like you've, uh, you're, you're at least managing that, which is brilliant, brilliant stuff. So for the next question, then, um, an, another interesting one, I think easiest way to kind of say this is who, if we go back to your coaching and your coaching style and philosophy, who was the main influence on the way you coach, you know, perhaps? Hmm. Um, I, I'm not sure there was one. I think I, mm-hmm. I did a lot of studying in my degree of uh, key thinkers in education and people that kind of really changed the the paradigm of of how people thought about from from i guess if we're looking at school from the kind of transition of um schools in the victorian times producing factory workers to uh schools more modern modernized schools at looking at producing or helping children be, become what they want to be rather than force them down a direct avenue. So there's a fair few key thinkers there that, that thought a lot outside the box. And I, I guess what I learned from that, rather than learning from a particular individual, is that I should build my own philosophy and I should make my own mind up with various things in mind. So, so from that, I think I became a very, the initial stage of building my own philosophy, I think I became a very pupil-led um, mm. coach. So I, I I felt the need to help whoever I'm working with express themselves before I weighed in with an opinion. Um, so it, it, that translated very much to my coaching where I would be uh, very, um, what do you think of the situation? And I would let them talk to, even if I had my, my own opinion, I, I would want to hit their point of view first. Whereas uh, again, and, and not necessarily saying it's wrong, but I, I do see a lot of coaches come in and say, this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong. Um, before they really get the, to be honest, uh, a lot of the time it doesn't really matter what is right and what is wrong. What matters is that you understand how they, how they formulated the belief that what they were doing was right uh, and how you can shape that and, and change that. So uh, I guess um, some key thinkers of education started the very like core fundamentals of my, my thought process around what type of coach I had. I think there was a lot of influences on me perhaps from my parents um, growing up, as well as kind of teachers that I had in my young years and football coaches that I had in my young years. I, I guess because I studied key thinkers in education during my degree, I also post that, went on to study um, 
certain coaches uh, in professional, in traditional sports, um, especially during my time in the LEC. I spent quite a bit of that. Um, so, for instance, John Ellis, who's who's um, who was my assistant coach at the time in in XL. Him and I went down to uh, Marlborough College in in England to meet a guy called Mark Elaine, who used to be a um, he was a, a cricket player for I think for Gloucester, uh, and then went on to to coach and and captain like his county, and he dealt with um, the his time coaching was uh, largely spent in the kind of professionalism of cricket where they would just play games and go to the bar and have some beers or whatever after the game to, to the actual more professional outfit that you perhaps see now. And um, obviously esports a lot in, and still in that kind of transition from, from playing games at home to what is a, a professional e- esports athlete, like the, yeah. actually that transition. So th- there was various people that we studied. I d- I'm not sure there was like one specific um, key kind of uh, influence, but I think it was taking bits from from the likes of like Sir Alex Ferguson and seeing how he dealt with cer- certain situations, disciplinarian kind of style, hmm. um, or uh, influences from from teachers of my own or teachers that I studied, coaches that I studied. I, I did a lot of research about how different people dealt with different situations to to really. I guess then took my own stance on whether I believe that that's how I should do it or whether, whether the, it's, it's really thinking about the way you talk about people. It's really thinking about um, how certain people respond uh, to, right, to yeah. really get that. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of modulating your, your impact and your methods uh, and so on. Interesting. Very, very, very cool stuff. So uh, yeah, I get the impression that it wasn't perhaps one person in particular that had influenced everything, but an amalgamation of loads of different yeah. influences. I think there's key fundamentals to all of that. And then it's like building blocks that you, you, you build to become a more well-rounded coach. I, I think the biggest key for any upcoming coach is don't think you've ever learned enough because there is never enough to learn. Like it, you're always, you, you have to be any, any, any position of developing other people, you have to commit yourself to learning how to learn and being a lifelong learner. You know, you have to constantly be looking for better ways of doing what you're doing. Um, you can never kind of rest on your laurels and be like, I do it this way and that's the way I do it. And that's what I'm going to do forever. Um, I think you've got to constantly be adaptable, um, versatile. And a lot of the things that you do are not based on you. They're based on the people that you're working with. They're they're based on the reading the room, so to speak, um, about the way that they want to be dealt with. Some people need that kind of, um, arm around the shoulder look come on you can do much better than this some people need that look this is not good enough um, we need to really step it up so the, it, it's understanding it's understanding the room to be able to to really best impart um, your mm. coaching experience to to develop these these players absolutely yeah uh, completely agree you know we, we need that adaptability uh, in these roles to be able to to, to mold and, uh, and fit ourselves to those people we're working with great stuff some fascinating answers coming through here and um, just uh, the the next sort of question I guess for now for your current role you know your, your work with the agency well, what do you enjoy most uh, about this role I know this might be hard but maybe we'll keep it keep it to two minutes sure um uh I think again it's it's seeing players recognize their potential um it's seeing that their heart so for me it used to be very much um their hard work throughout the split and developing as a player now it's me using their hard work from last split and then showing them that that hard work is actually meaningful and i can put them in a better place for 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 the next split um really uh, and i guess there was a lot of questions um, both from me and for players that I've spoke to over the time that I've been an agent about the value of an agent um, in esports and and what we can really do. And when I see the players see that value bec- uh, because of the acts that I've taken, that's when it, it really feels rewarding to me is that they actually see that this was the right choice that they made on and, and working with me and that, that they can see particular value. And I know that we passed on to their teammates and uh, and to, to kind of future players upcoming. Um so yeah i mean that i guess is the the most rewarding part for me wow brilliant so i mean that, that sounds remarkably similar to you know your your coaching role for sure i mean I, it's, it sounds like that ability to 
to show people that what they're doing has helped, uh, has worked, and what they're doing is working on themselves is, is really, really valuable. So brilliant, brilliant stuff. Good to hear you're still kind of getting that in, in your work at, at the agency. Um, and then it's quite a, another tough, tough question. Might, might take some reflection, this one, but um, what, what's your proudest moment that you've had in your work ever you know this could be whether it's um coaching days this could be agency currently it could be anything you know um i think probably i mean th there's a lot of proud moments which weren't that bigger achievements in, in in perhaps other people's eyes but i felt really proud because i knew like the backstory of the players or or, mm. or anything like this um but i think probably overall it may be maybe kind of right in the performance side of the application with John to to secure Excel's place in the LEC because um, one from a from an outsider point of view Excel should never be uh, should never have been an LEC team they had they, they had no more than any of the kind of UKLC or NLC teams of today uh, about them um, and to get there felt like someone above and in that case riot had seen something in us that that no one else would be able to see um so i felt very proud in getting there and i, I think also it's partly like almost the proof was in the pudding that actually we could make it in esports full-time um you know, on really good money better money than i could have ever got in in any other kind of um perhaps more mundane or or uh general home job that i perhaps wouldn't have enjoyed so much but actually could have just gone out and done uh, like i mean obviously the salary jump in that kind of job was huge but it's as as easy a way of any of, of proving actually uh esports is something that you can make a make an actual career out of and make um a serious go at if you if you do things right yeah wow i mean it's it is amazing especially kind of looking you know excel's now very much a, a household name very much a solid part yeah, i mean of they just raised 20 million investment as well so like they're doing good yeah they are they are and for for, for those who, who don't know just a bit of background um to fern yes firm worked with um other members of staff to actually get excel the team excel into that level into the lec uh, at that point which was a huge step for them because obviously they've gone on to do brilliant things but but this is the man who who helped get them there in the first place so i think we could all kind of agree that that's a definitely a proud moment and, and I, I absolutely yeah if that was me i'd be bloody proud i'd be proud <laughs> i'll be smiling until the cows go there. good good stuff um so next question uh, an unusual one one i always find interested in asking people what what would be your sort of in a few sentences what would be your dream future for esports what would that landscape look like um I think hmm. I think it would be it's hard isn't it? it it's really tough because I think there's a lot of people that would want it to be more like traditional sports so there's a lot of people that want to keep it as far away from traditional sports and keep it its own entity as possible um, for me a lot of what the systems that are in place in, in traditional sports are put in place because of problems that we're now seeing in esports, you know, and, and um, there are some people that are reluctant to, because it's traditional sports, they don't want that overlap or it to be considered a sport or whatever. Um, they, they kind of push back a little bit on some of the, the systems, some of the regulations, some of the, um, because they didn't enter esports in the same way or uh, whatever it may be. But ultimately, we have to. Esports has to be sustainable to to live long term. Um, so businesses need to make money. Uh, businesses need to find ways of making money that's not just like hoping they get paid enough by the league that they're in to to do that. So whether that's sponsorships, I, I think player transfers, so player sales actually needs to go up massively, even at an LEC level most of the the moves that you see from team to team are free agents moving to a team a contract expires and a player moves to a new team so i think teams need to be more savvy transfer wise in actually ensuring that their players are sold and that their players are not not free agent transfers to to be sustainable um i would like to see more and more offline events where 
you can bring the human element into esports, which is connecting people that have spent a lot of time online building connections um, and meeting together. I think this happens a lot in leagues such as the LEC and the tier one tier one league there because you're at a studio every week at the ERL level again happens significantly less but I mean obviously during COVID times are tough for all the leagues but um, I mean even post that I'd been to pretty much every single UK final so I had met a lot of great people th- through the kind of UK scene alone um, but it was only a final maybe twice a year where you'd actually get people together so uh, yeah, I mean, the money needs to trickle down for sure. I'd like to see, effectively, professional teams in each ERL. Every single team is is a professional entity and not a, a kind of what I would call a bedroom organization where where someone just randomly decides that I'm going to make an org now and, and sign five players on a, on a promise, you know. Um, so, yeah, th- that with a pyramid of, for growth, with a pyramid that allows um probably promotion relegation rather than franchise i completely understand the way the kind of franchise league system works now and a a lot of that is to stop um is is to ensure that the quality of the organizations at the top level main are are maintained because they know that there's, there's been a vast vetting process to get into that league in the first place so they stay there once we get into a position where i would hope each erl has 10 really solid uh, professional organizations i would then like to see promotion relegation between mm-hmm. the leagues and and a different system um maybe even more like um traditional football has where they have their own <clears throat> national league and then the top teams from each national league play in a champions league style system rather than an lec which is an elitist view of the, the issue i have with the lec in, in in league of legends anyway is that um it is that it's it removes some of the the attachment to a, a place and as a result doesn't really build fan bases whereas if you look at the fan bases that are built on traditional sports it's be- it's not because they're the best team i mean there are fans obviously that support the best teams but it's because you have an affiliation with the team whether that's mm. because you grew up there or whether that's because it's your hometown or whatever and i would love to see more localization brought into esports teams while the players can be from anywhere the team has roots in a certain place which therefore builds a fan base as 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 esports becomes more mainstream and more known about brilliant yeah yeah that would be such a cool future i I definitely agree i'd I'd love to see that i don't ask your opinion on the european (laughs) super league debacle because i think we know uh, we know where that would go as well but no fascinating fascinating stuff here and here in your um, your kind of dream future in esports, I think a lot of people listening would kind of agree that that'd be a nice place to uh, I think end up with with esports eventually once once the uh, support is in place. Good. So our final question for for those who've managed to stay with us uh, for this very interesting talk is: What advice would you give to the next generation of coaches for those esports coaches maybe sitting at home contemplating joining a degree, joining a coaching course, thinking you know where where do I begin? What what would your advice be? to them um i think it would be to and uh, again th- this will be very contradictory because th- these are mistakes that i absolutely made myself but um i think you have to you have to be willing to take no's not as failures but as just like uh, as go to your next option you know um i think it's really easy you will get every single person that's ever succeeded anything got a lot of no's before they succeeded um a, a lot of turned down interviews a lot of applications not replied to um and you you have to be persistent and you have to not give up i think it's really really easy to be like i'm not going to make it in this i'm going to give up obviously there are logistical factors that, and same for myself. There's a lot of factors where you need to think about uh, the money you're bringing in and how long it may take to get there in esports or whatever. I think perhaps the beauty of, of some of these courses and, and degrees and such is that like all degrees, they give you a period of time where you are kind of supported where you don't. So in esports pre degree, you are having to work for ver- for almost nothing for quite a period of time before you build that reputation. Whereas if you can do that alongside a degree, 
you're supported by the degree, you're learning new things, and you can start to build a reputation while you don't have to be in a full time full time workplace. So um, that for me is one of the beautiful things about that. I, I think, yeah, the the main piece of advice I can be is, is don't take no's as a permanent thing. A, a no, a no is just um, is perhaps look down a different avenue to to where you want to make your break. Um, but keep being persistent and keep coming back and keep um, knocking on the doors that you want to knock on to, to get to where you want to get to. Because if any, anybody who takes nose is a, I'm going to give up, um, we'll, we'll never make uh, the, the top, the, the, the kind of top of where they, they can really, um, the potential that they, they actually have for themselves. So. Absolutely. Wow. Brilliant, brilliant advice. I'm sure anyone listening to that will be very happy to hear that. I absolutely agree. You know, if, if we can start seeing those no's, like you say, as maybe hurdles rather than brick walls, then you're, you'll go far in the industry without a doubt, because it is unfortunately going to be full of a lot of no's before you get that one yes that makes it all worthwhile. But um, great, great. Well, first off, I mean, thank you, Fern. It's been amazing again talking to you. We've had some absolutely cracking answers. That I think I've learned a lot personally. I, I hope those listening to us have as well. So, um, yeah, there you go. That's the end of the episode. And, and thanks again, Fern. Thank you for having me. That's no, been great. Yeah, no problem.